This is the Read to Lead podcast, episode 444. We have, in many ways, redesigned what was seen as the only way to generate ideas. And in doing so, we benefit from more voices at the table, but also shorter live meeting time together. The way we work has changed. The era of toiling from nine to five, five days a week in the office is now a relic of the past. It's being replaced by a better way, flexible work. But flexibility means a lot more than a day or two a week to work from home. Hi, I'm Jeff Brown, and this is the Read to Lead podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth. I believe that if you want to achieve true success in your business and in your life, then intentional and consistent reading is a must. Today's workers want choice, and they are leaving their roles to find it. And today's leaders are going to have to go a lot further than offering occasional remote work days if they want to keep those workers. They'll have to redesign every aspect of how work gets done, from defining how they measure organizational success to training their managers to help make it happen. These and more are the topics we're diving into today as we take a look at a book called How the Future Works, Leading Flexible Teams to Do the Best Work of Their Lives. The authors of the book are Brian Elliott, Sheila Subramanian, and Helen Cup, and it's Helen we're having on the show today. I'll be asking Helen to share more about something I was alluding to just a moment ago, understanding that flexible work is about more than just flexibility in where we work, what it is that often gets in the way of more flexibility at work, in other words, why is it so hard for leaders and managers to execute on it, why and how flexible work works, and lots more. Occasionally, I like to make reference to a book that I've consumed recently that may or may not make its appearance on the show at some point in the future, but I think might be worth your time. The book I'm thinking about right now is a book I listened to on a recent trip to Indianapolis to visit my family. I'm not even sure how I became aware of the book. It just looked interesting to me, so I decided to to listen to it since I was going to be in the car for about 10 or 12 hours over the course of, of this past weekend. And the book is by Hector McDonald. It's called Truth, How the Many Sides of Every Story Shape Our Reality. And this is a book that I feared might dive deep into politics and maybe even lean to one side more than the other. Uh, But I found that though it does uh, certainly dig into politics, the author does a pretty good job of of not giving more weight to one side than the other, which I thought was, was pretty good. The book delves deep into topics like competing truths, two things, for example, that are indeed true, but are seemingly on opposite ends of the spectrum. How is that possible? Also, misleading truths. Things that are true in one sense, but are being leveraged in a different context for which they were not originally intended to drive home an idea that is not true. Fascinating read. Again, Hector McDonald, Truth, How the Many Sides of Every Story Shape Our Reality. Ellen Cup is a co-founder and senior director of Future Forum. She has led many of Slack's largest cross-functional and growth initiatives and is the creator of many of Future Forum's playbooks. Tapping Future Forum's research and networks, along with her experiences at Slack, Bain & Company, Startups, and her MBA from Harvard Business School. She's also the lucky mom of two wonderful children. Her new book, co-written with Brian Elliott and Sheila Subramanian, is called How the Future Works, Leading Flexible Teams to Do the Best Work of Their Lives. Well, Helen, it's a pleasure to have you here. Three authors on this book. I picked you. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting to talk more about our work. I, I'm dying to know first before I jump into questions about your work and the book. I'm a big NFL fan. <laughs> and, and the most recent winners of the Super Bowl were a team called the Los Angeles Rams. And they have a player, uh, a st- standout wide receiver by the name of Cooper Cup. And <laughs> I, have to, I have to ask, are you in any way related to Mr. Cup? <laughs> Oh, unfortunately, I am not. No, <laughs> so that would be a nice backstory. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me ask you about the origins of a future forum. This is an entity that I did not know anything about, was not aware of. I understand it, it sort of was birthed out of uh, uh, the folks at Slack. Tell me about how it came to be and what exactly was, was Future Forum uh, created to do? 
It's a great question. Um, very broad and ambiguous name, Future Forum. <laughs> the the three of us, so my my co-authors and founders, Brian Elliott and Sheila Subramanian, we had been working at Slack for a little while. And I think the common thread that brought us together to be at Slack was really about redesigning work. And we got to focus on it from a product perspective, but there was always this question around how can we drive true business transformation? That was something top of mind for our founder, Stuart Butterfield. And this was in the in the background for several years. Then the pandemic happened. And I think there was this moment where as everyone was shifting to fully virtual work and jumping into working in a way that was very, very different because in many ways we had to, I think at some point we reached the point of no return where it didn't matter if the pandemic was going to end tomorrow, right? I think Mm. we had been working under new conditions long enough that there was no going back to normal. Mm. And I think the three of us realized and kind of looked at each other and said, you know, this was, this would be our moment to figure out not just how to lift and shift those work practices that we had in the office to the Zoom format, which many of us did at the beginning, but to dig much deeper and use data to figure out how could we truly redesign how work happened from the ground up. And that, in many ways, was the origin of Future Forum. We started from a place of you know, an area that we all um, love to think about, which is thinking about the data and bringing the insights to bear around understanding what was happening and where were the bright spots. Mm. And then taking that and pairing that with executive conversations and stories from leaders about what was happening in their organizations and where there were these moments of light bulbs and ahas where they were doing things not just differently, but better than they had been doing before. Yeah, I know one of those ahas came out of your research that showed that flexibility was the second most important driver of job satisfaction behind only compensation. When you think of a flexible work, at least when I think of it, before I read your book, I often think of, well, well we mean flexibility in, in where you work, working from home, et cetera. But that's, that's only part of the story. What do you mean ultimately when, when you talk about flexible work. I think many of us are still having that conversation about flexible location. If you think about what's in the media right now around leaders deciding, you know, should we be in the office one day a week, two days a week, three days a week? And that narrow focus, I think, is only one dimension of flexibility, like you said. Mm. Um, when, When we looked at the data, yes, a lot of people want flexible location. 80% of the people that we surveyed, Mm. but almost everyone wants schedule flexibility. And so what do I mean by schedule flexibility? You think about, and I wish I could show you this image of my calendar in 2019. It will probably feel very familiar. There's lots of back-to-back meetings, nine to five. And I feel like in, in many conversations today, some of our calendars still look like that, even though we've made them virtual. And the reality is when you're in those back-to-back meetings, you don't feel like your work is very flexible at all. Mm. You still feel like you're a little bit chained to the desk, right? chained to the video conference. It's a, it's a big driver of that Zoom fatigue that we've been all feeling. Mm. Um, and so schedule flexibility really means figuring out how to work differently, how to rethink the role of meetings and collaborate more asynchronously so that you have focus time for individual work where you can work when you work best and balance that with a smaller subset of hours where you can collaborate with your team or what we like to call core collaboration hours on our team. Mm. I think if memory serves, I believe it was 2% of Slack's workforce was working outside the office pre-pandemic. Is that correct? Uh, Yes. Yes. So even though we created a tool that actually Slack is great for distributed teams, um, it it will surprise a lot of listeners as well as people that we talk to that Slack as a company was very office-based and headquarters-based even 
uh, pre-pandemic, where yes, a very small percentage of our employees were outside of our core headquarters location. I'm curious to know, apart from the pandemic, the pandemic probably being the most obvious, what else was behind the decision for Slack to truly make that shift? I think the the pandemic was a big driver like for many companies and executives that we speak with mm. because in many ways, it broke a pattern. Right? It broke some assumptions that we had about how and where and when work could happen. In the past, I think there was still... We still held on to this assumption if you had asked our founders, Cal and Stuart, that Maybe we could hire, you know, sales um, and some customer support in different locations, but core product design engineering, we all needed to be co-located mm. so that we could be innovative, drive new ideas and all of that. And when we shifted all of our work to virtual, there were a couple of things that happened. One is that we realized it could be done, right? That we had the tools to be able to work in a more distributed way. The second is that we saw that this was actually really great for more people. And when I say that, I mean, here's a great example that I often bring up. Um, I, I'm i very introverted, despite what I do for my job right now. And brainstorming is something that we used to do all the time. Grab a meeting, get everyone in the room, um, and come up with ideas. And I can tell you early in my career, I may have been the expert in the room because I was close to the research, the data and the work, but I remember 60 minutes would go by and I would have said nothing, <laughs> you know, because it's uncomfortable to interrupt people in that format. It's mm. uncomfortable to contribute when you're just, you're not sure how to get in mm. fast forward to today and our team really embraces brain writing over brainstorming. And that is taking that you know typical 60-minute conversation and saying, let's break it apart. Let's do some of this asynchronously where people have the time to jot down their ideas, to think deeply about what they want to bring to the table, share that in advance, and then maybe actually have a shorter meeting to discuss mm. and debate those ideas live. And I found that one, it is way easier for me to contribute in that way. Mm. But two, we we have in many ways redesigned what was seen as the only way to generate ideas, right? And mm. in in doing so, we benefit from more voices at the table, but also shorter live meeting time together. And so I think when I go back to why did Slack decide to go all in on digital first? In many ways, we were forced to do it and it opened our eyes to the possibility and the opportunity. And the other side of it is we've had these chances to include more voices and do work better and differently in a way that I think we're really, really excited about. Um, and so we've gone like I said, all in, we are mm. digital first um, in our work. And so the, the, the in-person supports the digital, the, the face-to-face supports the digital versus the other way around, basically. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And I love this idea of, of brain writing versus brainstorming. It is so in line with the cohort that I started a few months ago, Note Making Mastery. And you know, I'm a big believer that if you've only thought about ideas or read about ideas, you've not done enough. You really need to write in order to think. I think writing is thinking. And, and without that practice, you'll find yourself in conversation having only read about it, let's say, a particular topic, and, and, you, and you go to speak about it, and suddenly you realize you don't know nearly as much about it as you thought you did, and it's because <laughs> you haven't written about it. <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Being able to write, especially in narrative form, I have been finding is a great way to really develop clarity in thought. Mm. You write a lot in the book about Dropbox and their culture. And it was so location strong, I guess, in the sense they had these you know, state-of-the-art workout gems and they, they uh, brew their own coffee and all these kinds of things. Uh, in what ways is, is Dropbox uh, different now? Very similar. And I think this is a story that you could tell about 
a lot of major tech companies in the mm-hmm. Bay Area where a lot of money was spent on that beautiful office headquarter, mm-hmm. the baristas, the you know amazing conference rooms. At the same time, you know, Dropbox made that same shift. And the story that we tell is that one of the big reasons is, you know, when they surveyed their employees, when they actually went back and listened, despite all of the things that we've been working through, you know, trying to do work during a health crisis, a social crisis, a caregiver crisis, Mm. their employees still preferred flexible work over not having flexibility. Mm. And when they when they went all in and started to look at the data about what were the benefits of flexibility, they saw that it was it really opened the door to a, a much larger and much more diverse talent pool. I think some of the, the data points that I cited were they they saw three times the number of applicants, right? 15% faster time to hire and a 16% increase in diverse candidates. And you think about the traditional cities and locations where some of these companies were headquartered, like San Francisco. I uh, I live in the Bay Area, and I will say it's it's tough. It's not very diverse here. Um, being able to really hire from non traditional cities has broadened our talent pool in such big ways. It's really interesting when you think about the impact on things like talent attraction, talent retention, if companies aren't willing to seriously consider uh, just flexibility in location, flexibility with regard to to, to when uh, they're, they're really missing out. They're, they're going to lose that battle to other companies who are considering uh, those competitive advantages for sure. Oh, absolutely. The thing that I often say is flexibility is now a core requirement. Right, it's not even competitive advantage. It is table stakes for what people are looking for from their companies. And when you think about it, our research has shown that people will vote with their feet. Seventy percent of people are willing to look for a new job in the next year if they don't get the flexibility that they're looking for. Mm. And sometimes, you know, I I know I speak with a lot of naysayer executives out there who are like, oh, but we are entering an economic recession. That's not true anymore. And here's what I would say as a thought exercise. Think about the best people on your team. Think about the best people within your organization and ask yourself if you really believe that they are not going to be able to find another job or even multiple jobs if they really wanted to. And then extrapolate that and think about as you as you sort of leave this in their hands, who really stays in your organization and who leaves when you are imposing some of these top-down mandates? And what kind of team, what kind of company are you building for the long term at that point? For for many, this might beg the question: you know, why isn't everybody doing this? What, what's what's getting in the way ultimately? in your view of, of, of some companies being so slow to adopt this mindset? Before starting this episode, I think we, we were talking offline about the concept of you know, habits and habits mm. that you build um, personally, but also within your organization. Mm. And what I often see and coach is that in many ways, the, the last three years have broken some core assumptions, but we have not figured out how to break some core work habits yet. Mm. And the the meeting, for example, the format of a meeting is a great example of something where we have relied so heavily on the live, let's get together, block 60 minutes on the calendar meeting as a vehicle for work. In many ways, like I said about schedule flexibility, we have to break that habit and say, I'm not just going to set a meeting for the sake of showing that we're working together, but how do I flip that on its head and think about it differently? Do some things asynchronously, do some things together as a team, but be a lot more intentional about how we come together and when we do that. And habit breaking, as you know, is hard. (laughs) I mean, think about every January 1st and everyone's New Year's resolution about getting that summer bod. 
you know what to do, right? Like, you know, it's about eating right. It's about moving more. It's simple. And yet, why is it that we still struggle with it? That's because it it requires breaking some habits and taking those steps towards building small new norms and new habits. Um, and so in many ways, habit breaking is tough. Doing something um, different than you know the decades of the ways in which we used to work. Um, there's a bit of nostalgia associated with the office when we think about, oh, but you know, we need the office to come back and build <laughs> culture and connection. And we forget to ask ourselves, for whom did that work well for? And so I think I think there really is an opportunity for us to just at at the very baseline of all of this work, the thing that I'm most excited about is just bringing intentionality back to how we work together. Mm. Well, we've talked a bit about the sort of the what of this process, the digital first aspects. I want to spend some time talking about the how, the sort of uh, flexibility within a within a framework idea, which is is what much of the rest of the book is. We really haven't left uh, the first couple of chapters here in our conversation. The the bulk of the book is about the seven steps uh, to getting there, right? And I'd love if you could maybe summarize those steps. You don't have to go into a lot of detail necessarily, but if you could summarize some or all of those steps to getting there ultimately. Yeah. Um, We talk a lot about the case for flexibility um, in this first part of our chat. But the genesis for the book was that we were having so many of these conversations where executives were coming to us and saying, okay, great, great. I I buy into flexibility, but how do I do that? Where do I even start? It in many ways is easy because like I tell a lot of leaders, you've kind of been doing a version of this. Just Mm. keep doing it and Mm. learn from it. And in many ways, it feels hard and daunting because you're looking at, you know, when I say like, oh, there's an opportunity to redesign from the ground up. It sounds very big and vague and ambiguous. <laughs> um, and so the 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 goal of the book um, and the seven steps was to be a little bit more prescriptive about how you start to build flexible work within your organization. And it starts with, at the very beginning, it starts with this concept of principles and guardrails because of exactly what you said, flexibility within a framework. When you think about what employees are looking for, they don't want you know the freedom to do work at any t- point in the day, right? I think that leads to kind of a, a, a much more chaotic work environment where you're not sure if you're supposed to be on 24-7. Mm-hmm. What they want is some structure, right? Our data shows that at least two-thirds of people want some sort of guidance and um, structure around how to think about the, their day and the why behind flexible work. And so it starts with principles and guardrails. Why is flexible work important to you? And what are some of the behaviors that you want to set, especially with how leadership operates, so that you're walking the walk um, and in many ways preventing things like proximity bias, any biases that might happen? Mm. And then it moves to taking those principles and guardrails and making that concrete within your teams. And I say teams because flexibility is not a one size fits all. Teams operate, teams have different needs, departments have different needs. So how do you translate some of those high level principles and guardrails into how you're working together as a team. So we talk about team level agreements. We talk about core collaboration hours and um, things like that. And then on the back end, it's really about then how do you create the support system, um, the infrastructure to ensuring that this all happens. So that's really about how you operate as an organization around culture of learning, reskilling your managers to you know, be able to implement some of this within their teams and really focusing as an organization on outcomes instead of inputs. As, as someone uh, who hosts a podcast about books and is a big fan of lifelong learning, the one that, that stuck out to me and jumped out at me right away was, was step four, normalize a culture of learning. I'm like, yes. <laughs> yes. Glad, glad to see that. <laughs> well, I want to ask uh, before I jump into some questions, 
not directly related to the book. Is there anything from the book that we haven't covered that you want to make sure we, we know about? You know, I talked a little bit about that, you know, brainstorm, brain write experience mm-hmm. for me personally. And the the last thing I would leave you with that I'm personally most excited about in terms of our work is that it goes beyond thinking about, you know, introverts versus extroverts and the opportunity for flexible work and where we can take this is also shifting the conversation away from just diversity to true inclusion and thinking about how to bring more voices to the table in meaningful ways. So something that was surprising early on in our research was, you know, a lot of people kept saying, you need the office to build culture and connection. But actually what we saw in the data was that sense of belonging increased as more and more people were working more flexibly. And it increased a lot more for our employees of color, our working moms, caregivers. And when you think about that example that I brought up around the ability to contribute, the ability to bring your voice to the table in ways that work for you, you can see why some of those you know insights led us to see that there was an increase in sense of belonging. Um, The other thing that we've sort of dug into with our academic partners is how much the office has been sort of built for a certain type of person, a monoculture that we never really questioned in the past. Mm. But what we saw over the course of the last three years was that as we worked with our academic researchers, like Brian Lowry, from who's a professor at Stanford, he pointed to the fact that as a person of color, being able to work virtually actually helped reduce the instances of microaggressions and the need to code switch when he was you know, on campus or for many of us in the office. And I think that is a real opportunity when you think about where flexibility is deeply tied to our own diversity and inclusion efforts. They go hand in hand. And it's an opportunity for us to really not only bring more voices to the table, but think differently about the ways in which we generate new and creative ideas. Uh, Helen, over the course of your career, has there been, and if so, would you be willing to share uh, a book or two or three that has had a major impact on you? Maybe, maybe it's a book or books that you often find yourself recommending to other people at certain stages of, of their career. Anything stand out for you? You know, the 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 one that stands out to me, um, and you've probably have read it, is Brene Brown's Daring Greatly. Her book, really focuses on this notion and the value of vulnerability. And more and more as a leader, I'm seeing how important that is and how important that is in this more flexible, inclusive, and connected world that I'm describing. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned that your favorite chapter was about normalizing a culture of learning. Mm -hmm. It takes vulnerability to do that. Mm -hmm. And as leaders, I think we need to shift away from feeling like we need to have all the answers, all the answers about what flexible work needs to look like and moving to a place where we say, look, I don't have all the answers. Here's where we can start. Let's use a team level agreement. Let's start by at least codifying some of the norms that exist today and then continue to use our time together to iterate on it, to make it better over time as we figure out what works and doesn't work. And that's really, that's really the way that I see great teams embrace flexible work is also embracing flexible thinking and operating um, and continuing to be vulnerable um, and be open to new ideas. And so, yeah, I think I, I've always been a big fan of, of Brene Brown. I think she, her style speaks to me as a leader, yeah. but um, is you know, so important to how we show up as modern leaders today. Uh, For many of us, David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, was a boon to our productivity with regard to our tasks and our to-dos. And and this kick I've been on recently uh, is sort of the getting things done for your knowledge. Getting things done was great for productivity and to-dos and tasks. Personal knowledge management uh, is key to, I think, expressing ourselves, managing our knowledge in such a way that we can take 
all these inputs that we get from all these different sources from other people, authors, and the like, and putting our own unique original stamp on that, bringing seemingly disparate ideas together to form new original ideas, and then putting those out into the world. And so I'd be curious to know when it comes to personal knowledge management, what are some practices, some things that you do to bring all that together that you're reading, maybe watching, uh, whether that's books or online articles or TED Talks, podcasts even. How do you bring all those notes together so that presumably one day you can take these ideas you've gleaned and then do something with them? Um, would it be very geeky to say that I use Slack to do all this? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll allow that answer. <laughs> um, <laughs> here's the thing. Um, I think it is valuable to be ingesting information from a variety of sources, like you said, to continue reading, listening to a lot of different things. You know, one of the things that I like to do is not just read business books or listen to them on Audible, mm -hmm. but to read and listen to things outside of my field, whether it's, right. you know, science news or um, thinking about what's happening, you know, in other industries and in tech, for example, ingesting a wide range of topics and information, I think is really important. And so we actually, in our family, we, we do use Slack because so much of my habits are built into Slack That's great. and we have a running channel for interesting reads and interesting content that we sort of use as a space to just share, um, mm. to collect basically. Yeah. Um, and what is different is the moments where there are sort of sparks of creativity after you've, you know, looked at a couple of different things. And this often happens for me on a run, not in the shower where you're like, Oh, there's something here. There's a nugget. There's an idea yeah. that I want to codify that I've been thinking about. And then translating that into an actual written piece, whether it's a blog article or an op-ed or a longer form sort of summary of thoughts, um, taking the time to do that and crystallizing that into narrative form, I feel like mm. really then takes the, here's the world of things that I'm passively ingesting into a perspective that feels a little bit more your own mm. um, and having a point of view. And I find that having a more regular habit in terms of distilling that and actually writing has been really important uh, for me in my own personal knowledge management and remembering, you know, how did I think about this? What was the framework yes. that I used? Totally agree. Totally agree. That it's a huge part of this process and, and, and in order to be successful at it, for sure, in my opinion. Well, we've got just a few minutes left. And I don't have time, I don't think, to have you cover all five of these. I'm speaking of the uh, what I call the dream big habits, the five personal habits that will supercharge your life. However, I might ask you maybe to pick one or two, if there are one or two that you see yourself in and maybe ways in which you practice that particular habit. I know you have them in, in front of you, so you can, can maybe pick one or two off the list there. Yeah. Um, I'll go back to tying this actually to some of the schedule flexibility points that I made. Mm -hmm. So um, examine your energy is really, really big for me. I can tell mm -hmm. you as an introvert, it's understanding my energy levels yeah. um, and, and what gives me energy, what takes energy away is vital mm -hmm. for me to be able to show up for my team and also for my kids in the ways that I want to. Um, and so a lot of the times it's really about like calendar management, right? Like I go into my calendar and I actively manage the week and say, okay, what are things that I'm really excited about jumping into and discussing? What's like, what's that full body? Yes. Um, <laughs> and what are some things where I'm like, oh, I'm dreading it. I'm dreading it. And then I, I get to ask myself that question, especially because of the work that I do. Of, do we really need to meet? Like, does this need to be a meeting? And do I need to be in there? Or right. can I actually get some of the takeaways later when you synthesize it and share it back to the team? Mm -hmm. um, doing that active calendar management week to week has been game changing in terms of creating more schedule flexibility for myself. I don't need to be in all of these meetings. Um, it gives my team the freedom to do that as well, right? Do as I do, mm -hmm. not just as I say. 
And it really helps me be so much more present when I'm in a discussion, when I decide to put that discussion aside and say, I'm here for Chinese singing class with my two-year-old. And that is just where I'm going to be right now. Um, yeah. And I have really enjoyed that sort of work-life balance. Um, that to me is is true work-life balance in my mind. Well, the book, again, that I highly encourage you to check out is called How the Future Works, Leading Flexible Teams to Do the Best Work of Their Lives. We've had the pleasure of one of three of those authors of the book, Helen Cott. Helen, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For more on Helen's book, be sure and visit the show notes page for this episode. That's at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 444 for episode 444. There you'll also find ways on how to connect with Helen on social media, including Twitter and LinkedIn. In the coming weeks, we'll have visits from authors Renee Rodriguez, Carmine Gallo making his third appearance on the show, Cindy McGovern, Mike Evans. In a couple of weeks, it's Jeremy Utley, co-author of Idea Flow, the only business metric that matters. And next week, we'll talk with Jeff Blackman, best-selling author of Peak Your Profits, the explosive business growth system. That and more on the way in the coming weeks right here on the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks for being here this week. Look forward to seeing you hopefully next time. Until then, as always, remember, leaders read and readers lead. Read.